All right, we're getting close to done. It's the end of module six. We only got two more modules after this. Okay, we're gonna talk about random processes in quantum physics. That's module C, okay. Um, this is big idea number seven. Physics one only has six big ideas, but physics two has a seventh one. The same six as physics one, but a seventh one that says, the mathematics of probability can be used to describe complex systems. Well, that shows up in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we cannot know for sure what is going to happen. The best we can do is calculate the probability of each possibility. That's the best we can do in quantum mechanics. Why is that? I don't know. That's just the way that it is. All right. Um, what are some examples of this? I don't know, I can't tell you when an electron is going to transition down uh, energy levels. I don't know when that's gonna happen. I don't know if the electron, let's say it starts in N equals five and is trying to get to N equals one. Is it gonna go four, three, two, one? Is it gonna go uh, from five to three to one? Is it gonna go from five to four to two to one? I don't know. I can't tell you what's going to happen. The best I can tell you is the probability of each possibility. We don't know the angle that a proton, that a photon will be deflected when it interacts with a single electron. That's called the Compton effect. We don't know the angle that it's going to be ricocheted through. I can only tell you the probability of each possibility. I don't know when an individual radioactive atom will decay. I don't know that. I can only tell you the probability that, that the atom will decay in the next second, or in the next year, or in the next week. I can only tell you the probability. We don't even know where an electron will be when we look for it. Those of you who are student quantum mechanics understand how wave functions work. Okay, um, so for this unit, students need to be ready to read the graph of a quantum wave function, so we're gonna talk about that, and know how to draw conclusions from it, and they also have to understand the probabilities and how probabilities are related to decaying atoms, in, you know, and how that gives ra rise to the half-life concept and things like that. That's what they need. All right. Um, the thing I'm about to show you, I do during thermo, but that's because thermo is my second unit of the year. So I do fluids in thermo and then the rest of the year. Thermo has these things in it called distribution curves. And so, and that's what a wavelength, a wave function also is. It's a distribution of probability. Now, my students in physics two, for, for, for the most part, are not taking AP statistics. Yours may be. I have a couple of kids who will take AP statistics, but not very many. And so I have to teach them what a distribution curve looks like, what a probability distribution looks like. So I'm doing this the first time a distribution shows up which for me is thermo, but here, if you follow the NIMSY pattern, it's gonna be in quantum mechanics. So I have them do something called the dice race. Here's the activity for the dice race. Each individual student gets five regular six-sided dice. And they get a table with rows labeled five through 30. On each row, it's just five through 30. Now, you can buy 10 dice for a dollar at Dollar Tree, but they're not stocked normally. It's only on special occasions. Um, you can get dice from a website called dicepool.com, or you can get them off of Amazon, maybe. I only give them five minutes to roll the dice. They're gonna don't roll the dice as many times as they can. They're just gonna roll, 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 as many times as they can. Every time they roll, they're going to add a tally mark next to the number that represents the number that they rolled. So here might be an example output. So this student rolled the dice as many times as they could over five minutes. And they rolled a nine on their five dice. They rolled a nine three times. They rolled ten dots total across all five dice um, twice. Eleven once. Twelve twice. Um, they rolled a fifteen 14 times. So as they're rolling, they're just going to mark a tally mark for where, you know, how many dots did you roll. Okay. How do you determine a winner of the dice race? The winner is the person who rolls the highest grand total number in five minutes. What do you mean grand total number, Mr. Friends, uh, John? Uh, here's what I mean. I mean that this student rolled nine plus nine plus nine plus 10 plus 10 plus, 10 plus 11 plus 12 plus 12 plus 13 plus 13 plus 13 plus 13 plus 13 plus 13. Now, your students should be smarter than this. How about... 9 times 3 plus 10 times 2 plus 11, plus 12 times 2 plus 13 times 8. Whoever has the highest number. So for me, the total of all that, 1764. 
You just add them all up. Okay, we're going to keep going. 14 times 5, 15 times 14, 16 times 7. The grand total, 1764. The winner is the person who has the highest grand total. All right, give them candy. The only reason we're giving a prize is because it motivates the students to roll the dice fast. See, when I originally did this, I, this uh, activity, I just said roll the dice 100 times. And it took 30 minutes because my kids want to waste freaking time. So then I turned it into, you got five minutes. How are you going to roll the most dice dots? Probably by throwing the dice as quickly as you can. Now that it's a competition and we want to throw the dice quickly, now I can make it five minutes. It's just a motivation to roll the dice quickly. So it doesn't take up a lot of class time. Okay, what am I going to ask the student to do with their, um, with their data then? What they're going to do is they're going to plot a rough distribution curve. Here on the horizontal axis is number of dots. Obviously, you can't roll between 0 and 4 if you have 5 dice. So we only start plotting at 5. No 5 is 6, no, you know, and that's kind of thing. All right, so notice that the distribution peaks and then goes down again. Very rough curve, very rough looking curve. So here's what you do. Now you can combine together everybody's data. What do you mean combine together everybody's data? We're going to combine together everybody's data so it looks like this. Okay, this is student A through student J. Nobody rolled a five. That's five dice all landing on one. But one student rolled a six and one, two instances of a seven, one, two, three instances of an eight. For 18, 12 plus 10 plus seven plus 15 plus nine plus 10 plus 10 plus 11 plus nine plus 13 instances of 18. Now let's see what that curve looks like. So for one student, we have a very rough looking distribution. When we combine everybody's data, First of all, notice that the uh, axis is different. This is 0 through 20. That's now 0 through 250. There's more instances, right? More occurrences. But now it's a much smoother looking curve. It's smoother than it was before. Now, what if we had 1,000 people playing this game and they all rolled the dice 1,000 times? It'd be an awfully smooth curve, wouldn't it? That's important to teach your students, is that when we have a lot of items that are behaving randomly, then we can predict what's going to happen. If you give me a lot of items that are behaving randomly, then I can predict what's going to happen because then the curve becomes smooth. That's an important part of this big idea. I want, those, I want students to get that idea. Okay. I use this to prepare my students for any kind of distribution. A wave function is one of them. A wave function represents the probability that an electron will be found at different locations. Uh, be careful, the probability is the square of the wave's height. So that means a negative wave height on a wave, uh, on a wave function uh, also represents a high probability. Here's an example wave function. I hope you can see it. Uh, it's like this. And so, what do you have? Well, you have a high probability of, having the, of finding the electron at this location, pretty high probability of finding it here, zero probability of finding it in these two locations, kind of, kind of some probability of finding it near the origin, none there, uh, decent probability of finding it over here, some probability of finding it over here, but no probability of finding the, the electron at those locations. Teach your students about quantum wave functions. It's not that difficult, but it's worth going over. The other activity that I do with my dice, and I bought 200 of them, is called the Radioactive Dice Lab. And this is how I model the decay of a radioactive substance. Um, get 200 six-sided dice. Mine come from a website called dicepool.com. I ordered them 12 years ago. I don't even know if the website still exists. I probably should have found out before I put it up here. Get a shoe box and make sure there's no holes in it because you're going to be shaking the dice in the shoe box. You don't want them to fly out of any holes. Get some kind of a jar or some other secondary container as well. Okay, here are the rules of the game. On each turn, you're going to close the box. You're going to shake it so that all the dice turn over. Open the box. Give it some gentle shaking so that no one die is sitting on top of the dice. And then on each turn, you're going to take away all the dice that land on one. So what is this like? Well, a radioactive substance is all these atoms. 
and each atom is just rolling the dice. And when the dice lands on a certain number for that atom, the atom decays. So here, each die is like an atom of the radioactive substance. Each turn is a second, or a year, or a week, or a period of time. So, each period of time, each turn, the dice get shaken, and then uh, any die that lands on one is a decayed atom. We count the number of dice that are removed, we place it in the jar, and those dice are never re-entered into the game again. We keep playing until all the dice are eliminated from the game. Okay, so let me show you what this will look like. Let me show you what this will look like with my dice.